Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for uh, being uh, at this panel uh, where we're going to talk about some exciting things. In some ways, I think the title of the panel does not do it justice, what we're about to talk about, but Realizing Change, uh, Practical Solutions for Major Reform in Higher Education. Really excited by the panelists that we have uh, here today. Uh, ben Nelson, right to uh, my left, uh, of course, the CEO and founder of Minerva. Uh, Mallory Dwinnell, uh, the uh, co-founder of the uh, Oxford Day Academy, and we'll talk about the other piece uh, co-founder of in a moment. Um, and then uh, uh, John said, uh, 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 Brucha, excuse me, um, the uh, vice chancellor and chief executive at SRM University. So uh, we're going to dive right in. Uh, ben, uh, you had a pretty big announcement yesterday. Minerva, mm -hmm. of course, has been, for those of you that don't know, it's been around for several years, graduating first class. Uh, in just a couple weeks, uh, or a few weeks away, uh, in May, and uh, you know, people have said, wow, you have an incredible active learning platform, aligns with what we know about how people learn and so forth, uh, but is it scalable? Yeah. And so now you have an answer for that question as of yesterday, I guess. We do, we do. So what, what was interesting is that as we were engaging with a lot of universities, many uh, of the universities were uh, saying, well, you know, we can't really educate all of our students, 15, 16 students at a time, and that's initially how we designed uh, our system to operate. But all of the research around active learning was actually done in large format classes. And so what we realized is that there was really nothing about a small class format that was uh, exclusive for uh, active learning. Um, and I thought maybe what we could do is we could actually show you what the new version of the system would look like. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, just to give video. you a little bit of context. So I'll give a little bit of a narration, but if we could cue up the video. And one of the important things to understand as, as we're about to, to see this is that the Minerva system is not really a technology. It is a combination of a curricular structure on cross-contextual scaffolding, fully active learning pedagogy, and then the Minerva form technology that enables students to continuously engage throughout all of their activities. And so what you see here is a sampling of some of the activities that students can engage in. The concept of fully active learning is even when you see a student doing something in a primary position, so for example, edit a document, you're going to see other students being able to participate at the same time. And in fact, even when there are students in prime positions, for example, having a debate or answering a question, other students may be responding to what they're hearing, and therefore doing deep processing. And so there are features like breakout groups, continuous voting, before and after polls that you can see in various formats to see how student opinion has changed over time, and the ability to continuously engage students through all of these types of endeavors. Now, one of the things that people don't know much about Forum is what's behind the scenes which is what allows the professor to actually manage all of this. So if you actually were to ask a professor to conduct the class while teaching, they wouldn't be able to do it. And this is why we have a timeline that actually can, based on the lesson plan the professor uploads into the system, can provide the professor notes on every section that comes up, as well as actually change the nature of what happens in the room so they can manage it correctly. The professor also has a lot of management tools. So for example, looking at what breakout groups and what progress occurs within the breakout groups automatically and have a heat map of which breakout groups need the professor's attention so they can actually go into them and participate and see if students are stuck or have an uneven distribution of conversations. And we extend that to the class itself. So for example, tracking not only how many seconds every student spoke during the class, but be able to do that across an entire semester, which have been the most versus least active students during that semester time frame. And in order to be able to accomplish all of that, really requires empowering professors and partner institutions to create curriculum that has those activities and that scaffolding built into it. So that means that professors can collaborate on building lesson plans together. They can build in learning objectives into that lesson plan and provide both intentional, foregrounded, and backgrounded opportunities for students to apply what they've learned, and design the activities in the class ahead of time. 
And, and that's really important because, again, you don't want to have that occur while the professor is teaching class. So they can design it, get a preview of what the class would look like, and, and see how it would, would work uh, overall. The last component of forum and the system ensures that students receive ongoing feedback. And that means that the same process in which you provide students feedback on their written work, for example, their essays, all rubric-based, connected to the learning objectives that are set by the institution from a priority perspective, are the same kinds of feedback that they get when they actually are participating in class. And so professors or TAs can go back, review the class, provide the students the notes on how well they've exercise those learning objectives, and then the student can see a broader index of every single one of the learning objectives, how they come together towards bigger capacities, and they can review their performance by actually seeing what they did three years beforehand in the class, and how they exercised and got particular levels of mastery in that process. And of course, the big part of that news is that now we can have this fully active learning environment anywhere from four students to 400 synchronously uh, at a given time. So how does this change the trajectory of Minerva? It, it would seem to allow you both as the institute, but then potentially with partners to do some very different set of activities from what you've been able to do in the past. Yeah, exactly. And so a, a year ago, when, when we first talked about enabling other institutions to use the Minerva system, um, we, we talked about a very small pilot that we were launching with the University of Science and Technology in Hong Kong. Uh, which will not only continue, but it will be growing over time. But it was very much along the lines of small class format to enable a very similar type of curriculum and outcome for their students as we've seen for the students in our own university. Mm -hmm. What this new version of Forum enables is not only the ability for other universities to adopt this system in scale, but I think more importantly, for the creation and growth of new institutions in pretty dramatic ways. Gotcha. So that, I guess, is the perfect segue, because we have two folks that are signing up uh, to, to use this in pretty dramatic different ways. We'll start with you, Mallory. Sure. Um, we've known each other for several years now, uh, but uh, in, your, in your capacity of starting uh, Oxford Day Academy, uh, which is a charter school uh, in the Bay Area, uh, and, uh, uh, but now you're starting something for teachers, actually. So talk about what you're doing and how, how you're leveraging this platform and curriculum design. That's right. So, um, so about 10 years ago, I uh, did my PhD in teacher labor economics, which made me a terrible dinner party guest. Okay. And one of the things that was really fascinating was how disaggregated and how separate the way we train teachers is from what actually happens in the classroom reality that awaits them. Right, so as just an example, right now in the United States, you have to log more hours to become a cosmetologist than you do to become a teacher. For as seriously as I may or may not take my haircut, <laughs> a, a child's education is probably more important, right? And so, and so it's not just the quality of those teachers, it's also producing massive issues around teacher quantity. And so right now there are 100,000 classrooms in the United States of America serving over two million students where there is student but no teacher. There is nobody in there that is qualified to teach that child. And that's just bodies. We're not even looking at the quality of other teachers. And those trends are, it's actually expected to get considerably worse over the next five to 10 years. So all of this to say the idea for us was we need to first create a school where we can figure out what does the reality of a teacher need to look like such that in the short term it provides a high quality education to students while also similar to a medical residency model actually provide the space for people to practice and learn and become embedded practitioners for life after. Mm -hmm. So we launched the school, uh, Oxford Day Academy, two years ago. And now, uh, actually as of today, we are announcing the launch of our university, the Oxford Teachers Academy, that will open this fall. Congratulations. Thank you. So tell us about that school. What is, what is it going to look like? What's the problem you're solving uh, as you launch it? Absolutely. So with, with teachers, there are actually three big issues. There's recruitment retention and distribution. All right, so first there's the recruitment issue. Right now, in the United States of America, part of the reason that we have such a massive shortage of teachers is because it's increasingly expensive to go to college, the wages of being a teacher have stagnated in real terms, and we're seeing that in general the profile of who becomes a teacher, over time, those unit economics don't clear anymore. It doesn't make sense for me. 
to become a teacher, especially if it means I have to take four years out of the workforce, I have to take on a massive amount of debt to then become a teacher that may or may not be qualified to do well. Mm -hmm. So there's that first piece, there's that recruitment issue. And I'll, I'll talk in a minute about how we solve all of those through this method. Um, but there's that first issue of trying to tackle recruitment. And the second issue is retention. And we actually see two major places where teachers drop out of the pipeline in teaching. First, we lose 40% of our teachers in the first five years because of the fact that they feel overwhelmed, under-supported, and like they are not being set up for success. The second place we lose teachers is at around year 10 to 15, where it starts to feel like Groundhog's Day. I have done this every day for the last 10 years. I've started to understand my craft, but there's nowhere for me to move. There's no ladder for me to climb without leaving the classroom, so I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third piece is distribution. Over 80% of teachers teach within 40 miles of where they were trained. They're a very non-mobile force. So if you have these universities that are centralized, require you to be in one place, what you see are these ripple effects, where right around the universities, you actually have an oversupply of teachers, and then you get 50, 60, 70 miles away, and schools can't staff their classrooms. So our idea is to take, the, the way we solve all of that is by using the Minerva platform to take places where potential teachers already are. So namely looking at after school programs, like a boys and girls club, a YMCA, daycare centers, or sports leagues, and transforming their physical facility into a micro-university that allows the people at that site who are already working with children from that community to continue on in their work as a paid apprentice and to get half of their course hours from that work that they're doing with students. The other half of their courses is the content we build out and put on the curriculum or the, on the Minerva platform that actually provides them scaffolded real-time support for how they can do that as a better educator, not just as a childcare worker. The net result being that after four years, they've not only continued to make their salary, they've not only continued to not have to take on student loan debt, uh, but they've had four years of really meaningful scaffolded targeted support in the area where they'll be a lifetime teacher. So that is, that's the way in which we're using the Minerva platform to reach teacher shortages where they are, to provide teachers in those exact communities to become lifetime educators there. And then the last piece I would say about that is the way we deal with the retention is not just that short term, they've had four to five years of really quality training, but also we transform teachers that are at the 10 to 12 year mark into the mentor teachers who help provide that support. So it provides that next level in the rung for people who are, who've really started to master their craft. Super interesting. So let me turn to Jamshed now. You're in India, um, so paint the picture for us of the problem that you were facing when you came in, uh, in into the university there, and how you how you're partnering now on the solution, uh, and, and sort of why and what it's going to look like. Sure, thank you. Well, I moved uh, to India, back to India six months ago, uh, because of an opportunity to lead a brand new university in a brand new city, and uh, so. I could hopefully shape and build from scratch and not inherit a lot of baggage uh, and a lot of uh, practices that are too well worn. And there are really four things that I uh, came to see that required some sort of serious innovation. Uh, one is student engagement. Uh, in India, uh, even though India produces large numbers of talented people that feed you know, the global economy, the higher, higher education is still stuck in a model of lectures, usually large lectures, and then midterm exams and final exams, and that's it. So you have, other than the 10 or 15% of students who really want to be there and want to learn, you know, who go on to be academics like us, the rest of them are not engaged. So there's high absentee rates, and universities try all kinds of things to force attendance. In my view, is you can force a student to be there, but you can't force them, their minds to be there. Uh, so there's lack of, of engagement. Uh, and then they just cram for the exams at the end. And so the forgetting rate is very fast and not much deep learning that transfers elsewhere. The second issue is communication skills. All the employers in India are saying, your graduates cannot communicate. Okay. Part of it is English. Uh, the English is the lingua franca for professional life in India. But in fact, uh, 
very few students have the kind of fluency that you would find in some of the elite schools. So you have a huge variability. Some students are technically very strong, you know, very good at math and computer science, but don't have uh, good communication skills in English. <clears throat> and the employers are complaining about that, and the universities are doing a lousy, lousy job of that. Uh, the third issue uh, is um, the scale uh, at which some subjects, particularly computer science, need to be taught. So we have now, in the first two classes that we've established, we have a school of engineering, and we have a school of liberal arts. In the first two years, we have 1,400 students. And how many computer science majors do you think we have? 800 out of 1,400. And we don't want to just cap the numbers, because they're actually some of the strongest students. And yet, computer science is the, the most difficult field in which to recruit faculty, um, not just in India, but everywhere except maybe the top you know, American universities. So we want to maintain a favorable student-faculty ratio. Our target is 15 to 1. But in computer science, our ratio is 60 to 1. So how do you provide active learning, active engaged learning at scale to students who may not be prepared in a variety of ways. And finally, uh, as a cognitive neuroscientist, I've always wanted to have the opportunity to actually implement research on learning. Uh, it's, it's very frustrating that even though most of that research is, goes on in American colleges and universities, very, very little of that is actually put into practice. Uh, and uh, why is that? Well, you know, as professors, and I come from the professoriate, we all believe to the point of knowing that we're teaching in the best way. Okay? Everybody has a view about education, and everybody is certain that they're right about it, particularly us professors. But the data show that a lot of it is just not true. A lot of it is just not supported. Um, we tend to teach as if we were teaching ourselves when we were in college, you know, that top 10, 15 percent of students who were academically motivated, even though vast majority of our majors go on to Wall Street or medical school or law school or something else. Okay. So those are some of the issues. And I've been following Ben's work for a while. We've interacted uh, in former iterations of my career. And so I turned to him and said, do you have a solution for these four things? And he said, the way Ben is, 50 milliseconds, he said, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to do that. We're going to have our computer science faculty are going to get trained on the, on the platform. They're all, they're all excited about it to, to teach introductory computer science uh, at scale. So they'll teach courses of 60, but in cohorts of, what is it, 12 now? Or it, it's a, this 2.0 version allows a lot of active and interactive learning. And our English faculty have also come along to teach what's called communicative English, which is a requirement in India, but on this platform uh, through a course that Minerva calls uh, Expressive Clarity. So we're going to start next semester, and I'm going to join the faculty in learning the platform and also teaching. So we can, you know, I can lead by example. And we have. Uh, a big uh, adventure ahead of us. So what's common among you all is that yeah. you're both new schools doing this. Right. I'm curious, Ben, and, and I actually I'll love you yeah. all to jump in and reflect on this. Uh, you know, you're, you're bringing a package of <clears throat> pedagogy, technology, curriculum to, to the fore. I can see a new university working with this. Are we going to see any existing universities work with this? What, what does this mean for, for where you go? Well, I think, I mean, SRM is an interesting example, right? So even though it is a new-ish university, it is on its third class, right? They have a faculty, they have deans. Right? We're in our second class. We'll be starting. Yeah. Right. You'll be I, starting I started the second, beginning of the second academic year of its existence. But already a lot of inertia had been set. Right. And so, yes, trying to change that. But for a 350-year-old university or 100-year, it's as likely to adopt that as going to, the, going to Venus. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, and I will say that, you know, the new institutions move 
very, very yeah. fast. Right? So when we, when we first uh, encountered, well, when the University of Science and Technology in Hong Kong first asked me to come to, uh, to campus um, and give a talk, it was 18 months between that time until we launched this, the program. Now, when they invited me, I didn't know they were interested in launching the program. I thought they just wanted me to come visit campus. Um, but we generally find that, um, as we're dealing with several other universities, it's usually an, an, an 18 month ish process mm -hmm. uh, to go from initial conversation of, oh, this is interesting, until you can go through and you know, walk all of the various constituencies through the process. Now, we're very lightly involved in that process. It's mostly internal conversations within the university, but uh, we, we obviously try to um, provide some of the evidentiary basis behind what, why we do what we do. And, um, and also, I think even as in, as in um, Mallory's instance, make it very clear that we, we use our existing curriculum as effectively default settings. We, we have very little pride of ownership of the curriculum itself. Um, we think about it as a starting point, and from which point it's much easier for a professor or a department or an entire faculty to modify. Right? So if you, if you put together a, a group of faculty members in, in a university and say, oh, you know, you should come up with a new form of general education, as I think every single university does every single decade, you get the same general education you had before, right? Because when you start from a certain basis, you say, oh, well, I have to deal with you know, subject matter and I have to have the history classes and the science classes and everything else and distribution requirements, and all of these reform efforts wind up getting you back to the same place. If you actually have a stochastic break and you say, okay, let's, let's start with a new paradigm, right? list learning objectives, particular habits of mind, foundational concepts that you're interested in, scaffold them throughout the curriculum, provide them in many various contexts. Now, come together as a faculty and decide what habits or concepts actually are not crucial, what are missing and should be added that aren't there, what kinds of additional upper level programs do you want to build on top of that, right? We've never put together, a, funny enough, a course about education at Minerva, but you know, the Oxford Teachers Academy is going to create an entire program around education on, that's based on that same. So based um, on the curricular and pedagogical design, but correct. actually then custom building content. That's right, that's right. And, and honestly, I would go so far as to say, I think that a lot of existing universities will not adopt this and they will die. Um, so I, our shared mentor, uh, Clayton Christensen, has yep. predicted that as many as 50% of universities will close in the next by 2030, is that by 2030, 2040? He and I are in a bit of a revision on this right now. So, uh, <laughs> but at some point, the, it does not look good, right? The dinosaurs, you know, the dinosaurs could complain about like when the meteor is coming. The fact that yeah, it's yeah. coming no, is it, the problem. It, it, directionally, it, I think it'll be 25 percent plus. But yeah. And I think why does that happen, right? And I, I think of this classic disruption theory, which is that people, organizations that exist, overshoot the needs of their consumer. Right? They start adding on bells and whistles that drives up cost, that then drives up non-consumption for people whose needs aren't met, who don't need those bells and whistles. We are absolutely seeing that in the United States right now. Right? How, how many billions of dollars are being invested in rock walls and in new dormitories and all of these things that I'm sure are quite enjoyable, they do not work for all of the students who need to work, who need to be close to home, or who are a non-traditional student and can't afford four years away in that traditional setting. So we have serious non-consumption. Mm -hmm. We also live in a time where the United States economy is going to become more and more dependent on some sort of skill, right? So non-consumption is not evidence of not needing that product. It's just not aligned to their needs. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for 10 years for a technological platform and system that allows us to do this. And, and my co-founder, Irene, and one of my board members, John, are here. They can tell you, patience is not one of my virtues. <laughs> we have not been waiting for 10 years because we think that, you know, that that's just the right thing to do. With disruption, a technological innovation comes through, and that allows new competitors to come in to target non-consumption and then to eventually beat out the dinosaurs. <laughs> this is what is happening right now, and I think we're at the very beginning of it, and I think we're going to see that. So you went exactly where I was going to ask you, which is it seems like you both are solving this similar problem, which I would say non-consumption. In your case, rural teachers, mm -hmm. how do you get them? 
In your case, you're in India, computer scientists communicate all these attributes you listed. Where do they come from? You both are tackling, it seems, similar dimensions of that problem. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, they're not exactly the same problem, but I think engagement is key. Now, we are a residential university, so we're not adopting it as a distance, as a distance learning platform, format. Where right. the faculty teaching it will be in residence, the students will be in residence. It's just that it's a way to use technology to help engage your student and to try to create uh, many seminars out of large classes in which not a single student can be anonymous. That's the biggest problem in Indian higher education today. It's very easy to be anonymous. And frankly, I think most leaders in higher education, they would agree, most students want to just sort of glide. Just, you know, they've gotten into the college, which was a lot of work. The families pushed them. For the first time, they have some freedom. They're away from the families. Uh, learning is not the first things on their mind. Uh, except for the, you know, some of, some of the good sure. students. And so this way, in a sense, they can't escape. I mean, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're on the screen, and the professor can, can parachute in and ask you a question, and you're getting all kinds of analytics about who's participating and who's not. So you're forcing their brains to be engaged, particularly in the you know, texting generation and all of that stuff. It's very hard to get the attention of students. Uh, and... Uh, in, in large classes, unless you are at an extremely highly selective college or university where most of the students are there because they want to learn. But let's face it, you know, India has, India is graduating a million students a month, I think that's roughly the number, into the labor force. Okay, from, uh, and, and the uh, employers are saying, there are a lot of good jobs. We can't find people with the analytical skills, the communication skills, problem solving, all of these things, discussion, because they've gone through, they've studied really hard from the time they were little. The pressure in India is terrible. But it's just to prepare for these exams, and they learn strategies, and they take coaching classes, and so on and so forth, but they come out not being what the, either the employers want or really the future of the country should want in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship and coming up with new ideas no matter what, what the field is. So slightly different uh, motivations, but it's the same thing. I think we, we probably will build a climbing wall, but... <laughs> <laughs> in well, India, it's much cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, and I think that's, that's another fascinating thing about both of these uh, institutions that, that you know, when we started our own university, we were you know, so proud of the fact that here we're charging you know, tuition and fees of less than $15,000, and you, know, you add room and board, it's $30,000. It's you know, less than half of the cost of a traditional you know, uh, a private uh, nonprofit university. And compared to what both SRM and OTI are doing, we look like profligate spenders. I mean, here's... Here's a, a four-year degree, right, that each of these institutions are going to provide where the all-in cost to the student, in OTA's case, is going to be in less than $10,000 a year, right? And in SRM's case, is well under that, and that includes room and board, right? And so, that, yeah. and, and so you, 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 and the, the remarkable thing is that the benchmark of what both of these institutions are doing is not to say, oh, well, you know, we're going to provide a low-cost, low-quality uh, offering. The perspective is, how do we produce the absolute best teachers on the planet? How do we produce the absolute best computer science students on the planet and do that for 5% of the underlying cost of a traditional private American university? I, I think that's really the, what is so remarkable about these two institutions. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I'm going in a bunch of different directions, but um, let, let's do this. I'm curious the counterfactual for you both. If this platform hadn't been launching as it is now, uh, what would you have done? What, what would your like? What would have your technology enabler been for both of you? Honestly, I don't know that we would have one because if you take again, when we look at the profile of our student, we considered trying to go through partnerships with traditional universities. Um, and, and we are now accredited, working on accreditation as our own university. But the problem is with us trying to go out into rural communities where you might have 
two people in Campo, Colorado, and then you might have five people in Athens, Alabama, and that's all that you can support without this platform that allows you to create a community from that, those disaggregated spaces. The, the cost of universities, right, whether through a partnership or through our own, coupled with that disaggregated, distributed population, I don't know that we would have been able to. We would have tried. I don't know if we would have been successful. I mean, you know, we would have done what we could. You, there are methods of, of engaging students in large classes, even if, yep. even without that. And you know, I taught at Dartmouth for many years, and as I started to think I need to innovate more and have more active learning, I would use some of those. So, you know, one very successful method doesn't matter how large the class is. You say I'm going to spend the first 15 minutes posing questions from the reading for today, and I'm going to start. I'm going to pose a question. Then I'm going to pick a name at random. It's important that it be random. So I have a little random number generator. Name flashes. They have to. You have to pose the question first. So they're all thinking, lest they be called, and then somebody is called. There are things that 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 are quite effective. Uh, other kinds of uh, methods. Frequent quizzes. The data are very clear now that quizzes and exams are not just assessment tools. They're learning tools. Extremely yep. powerful learning tools. But you have to do them often, and. Um, Things like we would have done what we could, but, but my experience in trying to get faculty to opti, adopt these techniques is it's, it's very, very difficult. You can get them workshops and training and so on, but in the end, they regress. It's just too easy to pull your notes off the shelf or your PowerPoint and go. Uh, I, I think you need a completely new teaching context in order to get the students and the faculty to have a different set of expectations. So one of the things with active learning, uh, uh, th where you know we've tried it, you know, other people at other universities without the technology, is often some of the students say, "Why do you want us to do the learning before class, and then just why are you asking us questions? Aren't you paid to teach us?" <laughs> they say that a lot. And in India, that's, that's, you know, we've had professors at our university who've tried that, say, come prepared with the reading. It's all there now online, and I'm going to tell you where to go. And then I pose questions. And they came filing into my office and saying, this fellow is not teaching. <laughs> uh, you know, tell him he's supposed to tell us the way things are. And I said, well, this thing called active learning and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult. And my hope is by completely changing the context. Just as if you're trying to cure somebody of an addiction or something like that, you've got to change their context completely to get them into new patterns. Otherwise, as soon as they go back into familiar settings, they're going to regress. So that's my home hope. But I, you know, I tend to be very much the optimist, and uh, we'll see. So aside, so, uh, the corollary question, I guess, uh, yeah. to some of this is, aside from the uh, dinosaurs that venture to Venus, uh, do we think we're going to be unleashing a whole new wave of, of higher education uh, across the world uh, in the next 10 years because of this? Is that what your expectation is? I, I think so. I, it's not my platform, but I think so. Um, and, and here's why, right? As you, you think about why is it that Uber has displaced all of the taxi fleets, right? Why is it that Airbnb have displaced all of the hotel chains? It's because they are able to be agile and nimble because they don't have that underlying infrastructure and capital. And now, how many pitches do, I mean, I live in Silicon Valley. Everyone is the Uber of shopping. Everyone is the Uber. So it's not just that they've disrupted their industries. They've created an entire new way of thinking about how we organize as humans around whatever job it is to be done. Mm -hmm. I don't see how this is any different. I don't see how this type of, this type of program, because it's more than a platform, I don't see how this type of program and system doesn't unleash that same type of, you know, this is the Minerva of teacher training. This is the Minerva of nursing. This is the Minerva of whatever it might be. I, I don't see how there'd be any underlying difference in what's happening there. For, uh, for India, uh, I think, you know, if it doesn't happen, then the country is going to be in trouble. Because uh, right now, the economy is booming. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, but that's not going to go on forever. And it's, it's got a very young population. Half the uh, population is under the age of 25 or 26 or something like that. And so while that's a 
advantage compared to China, where it's an aging population, because you've got this energetic youth you know, going out there um, and, and not an aging population to, to support. At the same time, you've got to get them ready. And right now, the gross enrollment ratio for higher education in India is only 28%. That's the ratio of students actually enrolled in college uh, relative to the, the number of students in that age group. China is already 50%. The United States is over 60%. What are these kids going to do uh, out there it, as automation increases? And so uh, when you have such large numbers, you're talking about hundreds of millions of students. The, the model that you know, I know and love, the liberal arts model of small classes, seminars, and close contact with your professor, it's a wonderful model. But it is simply not scalable in that part of the world. It's simply not possible. So you have to do something differently. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the people aren't innovating. One of the one big ironies about universities all over the world is that even though they're creating most of the new ideas and new innovations, they are loath to innovate in their own practices. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think you know, once I understood that the model that all my career I've, I've loved, this you know, small liberal arts classes and stuff, is simply not going to solve the problem at the scale in other parts of the world where they will never come close to an institution that is able to provide that. You have to think differently. And I just don't see how you can do it without, without being smart in some way. And I think the, the key question now is yeah. the question for governments and the licensing authorities. Because you could have one of two scenarios happening. New institutions are going to be popping up at breathtaking speed at, at this point. Because, as again, as we can demonstrate, we can basically turn on an institution of higher education in a matter of months, which with almost no upfront investment, if it's in the same language, and with some moderate upfront investment if it's in a new language. So, uh, government and regulatory authorities are going to have to de decide. Are they going to reform the way they hand out the taxi medallion and therefore enable a lot more taxis to hit the road but with the proper governmental authorization? Or are they going to continue to create difficulties in, uh, in, in trying to slow down that process? And then what will eventually happen is a bunch of institutions will say, you know what? We'll just operate Uber. We're, we're going to operate outside of the regulatory authority. We've already demonstrated that the quality of education is better than any of the incumbent offerings. We've already shown that we have much lower costs associated. Why don't we not do a four-year program and have, comply with various regulations? We'll do a, a smaller program. And given the demand globally for particular skills and needs, you may actually create an employer feedback loop that will just sidestep the, the, uh, the license garage uh, altogether. So, and I, so I'd love to believe the former will happen. I guess the lessons from disruption suggest that it's almost always the latter, that it goes around the regulation and then it caves ex post facto. But uh, I guess in time remaining, last question for you, Ben, which is we're seeing how this is altering and creating uh, powerful new universities uh, that, that will have a transformational impact uh, on, on populations. Uh, what does it mean for the core Minerva uh, yeah. as well? So, uh, you know, in, in, when the meteor comes, uh, we, we believe that we're, I guess, the crocodile. I guess they survived, <laughs> right? Yes, um, they did. So, we, we, you know, it's, it's kind of funny to, to put us together with, with the, the original dinosaurs, right? But in some ways, um, you know, we're, we are the most efficient and most effective institution in many ways of the old model. Right? And, and we're, what we're trying to do is actually to show all the incumbent universities that they too can follow that exact same model. Right? That, that you know, Minerva really wasn't set up in order to be a model for new universities to follow us exactly. In fact, as you can see, neither of, uh, of these institutions are doing exactly what we're doing, quite a different uh, uh, take on it. But we are meant so that the liberal arts college that is all, all of a sudden worried about what happens enrollment next year, right? And we've seen well-known liberal arts colleges beginning to, to go through these shutdown uh, uh, conversations and fears. 
top tier uh, universities that are all of a sudden saying, wait a second, my fixed costs are, are such that they're growing at a point where I cannot keep inflating tuition to keep up with it, discounting comes, in, uh, uh, et cetera. And I think one of the lessons that ASU has taught is you've got to increase scale of students learned on maintaining a certain level of fixed costs. And you can do that by degrading the quality of your education. I don't think society's gonna stand for that. Or if you have a way to increase the efficacy of your education, but also increase the efficiency of the use of capital, that, that's gonna be, I think, a very powerful way to at least shield from some of the fallout. And that's a perfect way, I think, to end the panel. So join me in thanking uh, the three panelists for embarking their journey.